Tennessee's second. Okay, gotcha. We're recording now. So I just want to say welcome to Tennessee's SACAC Advocacy Day. We are so excited that you all are here. It looks like we have some great representation from all across the state. So I'm excited to um, possibly get some other perspectives. But today our goal is really to share some important issues with you um, around secondary education and post-secondary education in our state. So we're going to discuss college access priorities, and specifically, we're going to focus on counselor to student ratios. And we just wanted to preface it by saying how much we appreciate all the hard work you do to support your students as they transition into their post-secondary education. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Leslie Sandifer, who's going to introduce our first speaker. All right, thanks, Anne Catherine. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Leslie Sandifer, and I'm here to introduce our first speaker, David Hawkins. Um, David holds an, a BA and an MA in government from the College of William and Mary. He has been with NACAC since 2000, um, so don't try to do the math. He started when he was in high school. Um, he uh, has held several roles since being at NACAC, and um, currently he serves as chief education and policy officer, a role which he took on uh, just about a year ago. Um, our research team found out that David has competed in Super Smash Brothers um, video game competitions around the country. So I'm sure that um, helps qualify him for uh, his position at NACAC. Um, our team with the Tennessee Legislative Day has, uh, we've had the pleasure of working with David over the past few years. And um, to me, David stands out for being just uh, very accessible, um, very personable, and um, always willing to step in and help um, speak to to um, everyone in the state of Tennessee and all the um, all the counselors, and just share his experience. and um, It's just wonderful to be a part of an organization that has someone um, with that willingness to help and um, and be available. Um, please welcome David Hawkins. I'm excited to hear what he has to share today. And David, it is all yours. All right. Well, thank you, Leslie. And that is certainly some good research you've got going on there. I, I have indeed compete, competed in Super Smash Bros. tournaments, uh, including one as far flung as uh, the Evo competition in Las Vegas, where I went with my son when, when he was in, in high school. So a lot, a lot of fun times with, with Smash. I uh, also want to want to thank you. Thank you, Leslie, first of all, for that, that great introduction. That's probably the best introduction I've ever had. Um, and thanks to everybody on the on the call this afternoon for uh, being willing to engage with advocacy. Um, you know, I've held volunteer positions over over time, and it is tough to do work outside of your regular job. And I want to thank you for being willing to step outside of that and advocate on behalf of the students and the and the profession itself. I think it's it's really critical that that we have people like you out there, you know, doing doing the work that um, that takes so much extra time. So thank you, thank you very much um, for being willing to step up. Um, I will also note very quickly before I get into the presentation that, that my connection to Tennessee is that when I was young, my dad used to travel on business to Chattanooga, Knoxville, and Memphis. So I've, I've been able to go and, and spend time in all those cities, um, you know, when I was a kid and have a lot of fond memories, um, mostly of hotel swimming pools, but, you know, uh, other, other things as well. Love the mountains, love the ter terrain um, in any event. Um, so, um, Leslie, I think um, we can skip straight to slide five, if I'm not mistaken here. Um, let me see. Yeah, it's a, it's a slide called NACAC Leads. And the reason I'm going to skip the first few slides is because th that's mostly background. And since, since you all have the PowerPoint or will have the PowerPoint, um, that you can go and, and read about what's on those on those first four content slides, which is really the deep background to how our priorities are formed. And that is, I can summarize it all just by saying our, our advocacy priorities stem directly from our association's core values and from the, some of the core leadership work that's been done to help us continue to refine our advocacy um, over, over the last two decades, um, at least that I've been here with NACAC and, and will continue to be that way beyond. So all of these priorities are very grounded in the work that you do um, and in the work that our leadership does to, to help guide us to, um, to, to articulate our policy positions. Um, so I'm gonna talk about our big three 
um, that's going to be the intro to to the more sort of current events part of, of, of my, my time here. The big three things where we really want NACAC in the front um, of our policy discussions nationally and, and would have the affiliates be there at the state level is we want to we want to first and foremost, and these are in no priority order, but first on this slide, um, student and equity centered admission practices. It's one of the reasons we are who we are as an association. We want to make sure that we are focusing on on the interests of students and on the interests of equity as we look at college admission policies and practices. And so NACAC has always and will continue to advocate uh, on that point. Our second point, we want to we want to emphasize professional responsibility and ethics. Um, I think for those of you who know NACAC, you'll know, you'll be well familiar with our ethical core, but for those of you who may not be as familiar, uh, we were founded in 1937 around a, a set of ethical principles, and those ethical principles, uh, we, we actually enforced those for a long time, and we've recently moved away from those as a result of, um, of uh, a Department of Justice uh, investigation for antitrust um, concerns, which is a whole other session sometime. Um, so we've, we've, we've pivoted to focus on emphasizing our ethics through advocacy. So we're going we're gonna to really want to look at, at ways to do that. And to give you an example of some of what we've done in the past, you know, the for-profit colleges um, have been, not all for-profits, but many of the larger for-profits have been engaged in a lot of predatory recruitment behavior. And our ethical principles dictate a whole different approach to, to admissions and recruitment than what we see in a lot of those for-profit uh, institutions. So we're going to continue to, to look at um, ethics um, as one of our th big three sort of core advocacy notes. And then the third um, and, and highly relevant based on, on, on what we're going to talk about today is uh, the expansion of the capacity and impact of school counselors and college advisors. Um, you, you all know we've done that for a very long time. So yeah, it's something we're going to continue and we're gonna, we're gonna redouble our efforts in this regard because we know school counselors have a positive impact on their students. And I'll tell you a bit, a bit more about what we know about that in a second. So we can go to the next slide there, Leslie, if that's okay. Um, what's, what student and equity centered admission practices really means when it, when it comes into practice. First and foremost, I think you've all seen that the Supreme Court is going to hear uh, the cases involving Harvard and the University of North Carolina uh, in the fall. We are going to be very active on that case. Uh, we're planning uh, right now uh, our, our framework for an amicus brief, which is a friend of the court brief, uh, which allows us to weigh in on the court's um, deliberations without actually being a party to the case. Um, and we want to also expand uh, the playing field here, because for a long time, we've been talking about this, this snapshot of a moment in time where admissions offices are considering race as, as one among many factors in admission decisions. We want to expand that conversation. We, the, the grounds on which admissions offices can consider race and ethnicity has narrowed substantially over the years. Um, there, I'm sure, will be a time when perhaps the court decides, and it could be this fall, that we can no longer do that, um, but you know we're going to fight um, with with all of our energy to, uh, to to preserve that right as as long as we possibly can. But in the event that that does get taken away, we want to look elsewhere. We want to make sure we're turning over every rock and un, un, undoing every piece of the of the machine and blowing on every part to figure out how we can maximize performance for equity um, as we as we look at what we do. So the next slide. Um, gives you a, a sense of, of what we've done recently. Um, oops, sorry, uh, we, you, Leslie, you can go ahead and advance to the next slide. Um, we, we put out a report uh, called Toward a More Equitable Future for Post-Secondary Access with our colleagues at the National Association of Student Financial Aid Administrators. And this, uh, this report just came out uh, in January. Um, and what I encourage you to, to go and take a look at it if you haven't already seen it. It really is sort of the very first salvo um, that we have made in terms of expanding the conversation out beyond this traditional area where the Supreme Court is focused. We want to think about every single aspect of what we do as a profession and make sure that we're oriented towards equity as our North Star. So that is a, that is a fairly clear articulation of the direction we want to move in. There's going to be a lot more specifics to come after that. But, but again, just an example of how we hope to make that that priority come to life in, in research and advocacy. Uh, so go ahead to the next slide there, Leslie. Thank you. Um, 
This 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 equity focused um, priority is, like I said, really about operationalizing uh, what are now our best practices for ethics, which are which are um, um, articulated in this guide to ethical practice in college admission that we maintain. Um, th the main thing that that you'll want to know about this is is that where, whereas we used to enforce this this set of uh, ethical practices so that someone could submit a complaint to us about a school or an institution doing something that might run counter to our standards. We no longer do that, uh, like I said, because of the Department of Justice investigation, but we still wanna articulate these as recommended practices. So we plan to do a lot more education, communication, and where needed, advocacy. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we may be, uh, well, we will definitely do more advocacy in terms of predatory recruitment and, and things like that on the public policy level, but we hope to expand more into educational resources and communications, not just to our own members and professionals, but to the public to let them know these are some practices that we consider to be good practice. And if you, know, if you have a, 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 a student going through the process, you might wanna know about these things. Um, so then we'll go finally to the to the next slide for our big three um, priorities, and this is where we talk about the the school counselors and college advisors. Um, one important thing we know from our research here at NACAC is that school counselors, uh, when 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 students are able to work with school counselors one on one, there is a statistically significant positive impact on college going behavior. Uh, we found that students who worked one on one with a school counselor were seven times more likely to fill out a FAFSA. Uh, four times more likely to go to any form of post-secondary education and twice as likely to attend a four-year college. Um, and when and that study factored out all the other things that might influence that pathway. So that that if that um, positive effect that counselors had was without regard to a student's um, income, a student's demographics, a student's uh, parents' level of, of, of education, all of which um, correlate very strongly with with who ultimately makes it through the, the the pathway. So, regardless of who you are, you work with a school counselor, you're gonna you're gonna see some some benefit. So, we want to make sure we emphasize this. And this is a map. Um, if you aren't familiar with it, a, a couple of years ago we did a um, a study of um, student to counselor ratios by school district within each state because we found that when you look at the U.S. ratio, which is somewhere around 460 to one. You look at state ratios, they tend to cluster in the 400s to one, although some states are outliers like Arizona, it has like 980 to one. Um, it it kind of masked the, the reality on the ground, which is that when you look inside of a state, you see some pretty big disparities. The green districts here have ratios that are close to or below 250 to one, which is of course the recommended student to counselor ratio by, by American School Counselors Association. The yellows and oranges are, are between 250 and 500. The reds are 500 to one or above. So you can see within a state, while the state ratio may look pretty good, and this is this, this map repeats itself for just about every state. I'll say Tennessee looks a little better than, than a lot of other states. Um, and I would attribute that to some initiatives that, that I know have, have taken place in Tennessee over the last few years. Um, but we still have our work cut out for us because we ultimately want to help. We want to make sure as many of those districts are green as, as can possibly be. So we'll go, well, we got two more slides, really quick ones. Um, so next slide, because we have those big three, doesn't mean we're not gonna focus on these other things, college affordability, undocumented students, transfer. You know, there's so many different things that we're still going to stay tuned and, and, and support and, and weigh in on. Um, but those, those three things are where we're gonna spend our, our, our big energy because it's where our expertise is. So the final slide, Leslie, you could put up there and just leave there because what I'm going to do is just quickly note that on the national level, I mentioned the Supreme Court case. We're definitely, that's what's a big one for us. I suspect that in both Tennessee and at the national level, we're, we're all looking at budget and appropriations. That's, that's where the year to year money comes from, right? So in, in generally each year and in some cases, every two years for some states, you got to pass a budget and those spending levels are going to dictate things like how much school districts get and then how much schools get, which in turn dictates how much how many counselors can be hired. At the higher ed level, it, it dictates budgets for institutional aid and things like that. So we're every year working on spending uh, bills. Um, so a couple of things of note at the federal level and then a couple of things of note at the, at the state level that, that we've noticed. Number one, um, the, the president in his State of the Union address mentioned that he wanted to increase the Pell Grant by $2,000. We are 
definitely supportive of that. In fact, we'd like to double the Pell Grant. So $2,000 isn't doubling it, but we'll take it. Um, that's a great thing. So that's got to obviously go through Congress, but we'd love that to happen. And then really what, what was what was exciting is he talked about a, proposing a billion dollars to hire school counselors and school psychologists to address the mental health crisis in this country. We would love that. Even though mental health is not our domain, so to speak, getting school counselors in the building is our priority, and that would be terrific. We will support that like nothing else. I mean, that, that is going to be very exciting for us. Um, drop, there's other issues that we cover, but I, but I want to make sure I'm respectful of time here. At the state level, a couple of things that we've seen, and I'd be interested to hear the conversation after me because I'm not the expert on these issues, but I did see a couple of bills, they're really identical bills in each chamber, that would, if, would, that would, that would require the basic education program, the basic, the, the funding level to, 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 to account for a 250 to 1 ratio of students to counselors. That's a really like <laughs> that's a pretty significant um, request, and 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 it'll be interesting to see if that if that gets traction. It looks like it it might have gotten a little, but but you know it'll be be very very interesting. And we would obviously support. Now we don't know all the nuances there, so so we would follow your lead in Tennessee, but we we like the idea of of building it into state funding systems that that you need to regularly support school counselors. So the idea is there. Um, two other quick things. One, I noticed that there were a couple of non-binding resolutions introduced to require the University of Tennessee system to collect, quote unquote, objective metrics of post-secondary readiness. I think that was an attempt to sort of reinforce standardized testing at the state level. We're not going to weigh in one way or another, although we accept to note that we don't think mandating this at the legislative level is not, it, we don't think that's necessarily a good thing. So I guess I did just weigh in. We're not going to weigh in at the institutional level. Ultimately, that's an institutional decision. State can can kind of step back from that. So so not thrilled about that. The other piece that was interesting that was that was related to um, standardized testing was that there is a a bill in both chambers that would require school districts to report the amount of time spent prepping for standardized tests. It's really a kind of an interesting bill, but I doubt it'll go anywhere because it looks like it's got Democrats as sponsors and and it just it hasn't received any any attention in, in committee yet. So just a few college admission related topics that we're watching on the state and national level. And I think I think I'm about at time and I know we have we have Q&A for later. So I'll I will stop there and Leslie, feel free to switch the old presentation out. And oh, and hope you'll give a follow to the NACAC wonk if you aren't already. That's that's where we post a lot of our up to the minute information on Twitter. Thank you, David. I think that's an excellent transition into exactly what Megan is going to talk with us. She's shaking her head. Um, we're so lucky today. Oh, by the way, I'm Kelly Petkavish. I'm on this great committee with Leslie and, and Catherine. Um, and today we have Megan Cousin Lark from Metro National Public Schools. She serves as the executive director of school counseling. And um, I have been just really lucky to get to work with Megan throughout the years on the Metro school side of things. And she is always so eager to help and so eager to best support students. And so um, with the historical changes to the basic education program funding this year, I thought it was really important to have Megan come and speak to us. So um, we will pass it off to you, Megan, and get started. Hey, well, thank you very much and um, nice to see everyone. And I'm glad to be here today. So um, Kelly did introduce me as the executive director of school counseling, but um, within that we have uh, 238 school counselors. And then I also uh, oversee our school social workers, which are about 72, our trauma-informed schools. Um, and currently we have about 74 advocacy centers, actually 72, we're adding two more next year um, in our elementary schools. And then um, with that, there's some trauma-informed specialists, six of those. And then we have a grant um, from the CDC. So I, I, um, all of the mental health type of uh, professions and, and uh, support areas kind of live within my realm. Um, so I'm excited today to talk about the new uh, BEP funding, right, which is called TISA or TESA, and you can, it really stands for the Tennessee Investment in Student Achievement. Before I go into that a little bit and explain, um, there's a big, long uh, PowerPoint, right? It's probably like 40 uh, slides. I'm not going to go over all of them today. I'm just going to hit the 
the um, main ones specifically that really are focused on the counselors and counselor ratio. And um, before I do discuss that, though, I want to talk a little bit about our counselors to student ratio. Um, you know, obviously, we already heard ASCA recommends a 250 to 1. There's some um, legislation on the floor that this new BEP funding uh, focuses on that, right? Really uh, ensuring we have a 250 to 1 ratio in the schools. Currently, based on ASCA's projections in the 2021, I'm sorry, 2020 21 school year, and I was actually actually really surprised about this, it said that Tennessee had a 337 to one ratio, right? And so that's pretty close um, to, to obviously what we want. And we were actually at the um, lower end, right? A lot of school districts, the average is like 400, 500 to one. And so um, I think that would be great. Now, one thing that I think people need to be aware of as we talk about school counselor ratios is even if a um, they are going with the 250 to 1 ratio, right? You don't technically get another counselor until you hit 500. So ultimately, you could still only have one counselor between one student and 499. So that is a lot of students for one counselor. Um, our current BEP funding formula looks at elementary students K-6 at a 1 to 500 ratio or 500 to 1 ratio. And at the secondary level, um, 7th through 12th grade, it is a 350 to 1 ratio. But again, you're not getting that second counselor until 1,000 or you're not getting it until 700. We're fortunate in MMPS because our district knows the importance of school counselors. And so they have um, invested some additional funds to ensure that we get a second counselor at 525. And so um, therefore we're a little bit ahead of the, the, the formula um, just based on that, but our hope is obviously to um, get closer to that 250 to one ratio. So with that being said, um, and this, you guys, was uh, Governor Lee um, and uh, Dr. Penny Schwinn, they uh, presented this new BEP formula called the Tennessee Investment in Student Achievement about three, four weeks ago, right, to everyone and really wanted feedback. They've gotten feedback throughout the last year, but it has to go up for vote in, um, to determine if this is what we really are going to use. So if you're not familiar with it, you will get the whole slide deck afterwards. Um, we can go on to the next slide. But basically what it is doing is it looks at um, our our historical background in this, right, where we started back in 1992 with the BEP fund up until where we are now with, I'm sorry, with the new proposed formula. Sorry, I'm at a school right now, so we had someone come in. And so this kind of just gives the historical background. So if you go to the next one, please. And then we've had, um, when they were getting feedback about what this new formula should look like, they received over a thousand um, public comments, went around the state to um, get that feedback. They also allow people to send in comments and letters and email them in. And so really looking at what was needed um, throughout the state. Go ahead. With that, they um, broke down broke it down into 18 review subcommittees. And um, it looked at various areas, but one of those specific areas really did focus. They had school counselors on all of them, but really looking at that BEP funding um, for specifically school counselors uh, was within one of these 18 subcommittees. And initially, when um, the state decided to review it and adjust the BEP funding, their priorities, they listed five main priorities and school counseling was number two on the list. Okay. And then, so this is kind of um, the next steps. Uh, Governor uh, Lee uh, introduced, right, the, um, the, the formulas and kind of his proposal. And then it has to go to committee and then Senate and House and then potentially be passed and then become law. Go ahead. Okay. And then ultimately, this is kind of what um, it was designed to do empower each student to read proficiently by grade three. 
prepare each high school graduate to succeed in post-secondary program or career, and then also to ensure that they have the resources needed to succeed regardless of individual circumstances, right? So if a student is EL student, an EE student, um, is economically disadvantaged, there's a whole list of uh, different kind of indicators where additional funding is given. Um, but ultimately, the goal is to ensure all resources and that um, we have kind of equity across the board for all students, meaning they have what they need specifically. Not everyone has the same right, but they have what they need to be um, successful. And I'm sorry, I'm using acronyms. Yeah, so EL is English learners. EE is, we call it exceptional ed, and then ED is economically disadvantaged. So I'm just going to really go high level here and not into all the different sections. There was a formula breakdown and what it entailed was um, they're going looking to invest 9 billion additional dollars and 1 billion in new reoccurring state funds. So the stuns the state is going to continue to um, give these additional reoccurring funds. And then also um, they'll be looking at some local funding too. So then they'll also give 750 million in one-time state funds in um, 23 school year. So this won't go into effect if it's passed next school year, not 22-23, it will be in effect for the 23-24 school year, okay? Um, so the biggest takeaways, you guys, is that districts would receive more funding under this new BP formula than they would under um, the old BP. Now, let me, I'm going to say this, and I may be a little biased. Most school districts will receive. Um, if you really look at, and you'll, you can read, I'm not going to get on my soapbox right now, but you can read about um, our school district to where we're actually getting like $200 million less. Um, and we have um, some of the most diverse kids in the whole state. So I won't go into that, but basically districts, you know, will receive more funding or the majority of them. The local um, contribution uh, won't increase for another four years. So really it's going to kind of hold harmless. And then it will increase after that. And then obviously the General Assembly in the state is going to put some money into that. And so this is kind of the four main areas. And there's a fifth one too. Um, no, actually it's the four main ones. The three direct funding base and weights are kind of the main areas. This outcome funding is, um, they're looking at data and outcomes for students and incentivizing schools and school districts based on that. But what we're gonna focus on um, primarily today is just the base, and there's not a whole lot of detail yet, but the base funding is where our school counselors will live, okay? Oh, okay, I missed that one. So you guys, the base funding um, basically looks at teachers, counselors, school psychologists, your principals, your administrators. Um, and so that is kind of where this new formula will put our school counselors and they'll ensure that when they fund every school district, hopefully at that 250 to one ratio, then they're giving those base funds to um, so that every school district has the funds up front um, to have that uh, number or ratio per student. And so that's kind of the overall BEP funding, um, old formula to the new formula. The, um, I don't know if they call it TISA, I call it TISA, but basically the Tennessee uh, Investment and in Student Achievement. And so um, that's what it's looking like right now. So they haven't made any final decisions of what um, that number will be. And so that's where the advocacy obviously is needed, right? Because um, I can tell you from my perspective and my role, um, mental health after COVID, obviously you guys know, have heard, um, has increased tremendously. Behaviors have increased tremendously. DCS referrals have increased tremendously, right? And so um, the need is definitely there. Um, to help kids to learn the coping skills, to help them work through, whether it's their anxiety, their trauma, whatever they experienced during COVID. And, um, you know, obviously additional uh, school counselors will um, 
assist with that. And so hopefully, um, you know, if, if we can continue to advocate for that ratio to be lowered, hopefully to that 250 to one ratio, so we can get those additional supports in schools for students. Megan, I know people are going to have questions for you and David, and I know we have some announcements in a little bit, but I know you and David are on a more uh, strict time crunch. What, looking at the list of attendees that are here today, a lot of us come from the privilege of working in private school systems or, you know, community-based organizations. For our friends who are working in the public schools, what is, you keep mentioning, advocating um, for them? What What's the best way to do that right now? I know we're going to send this out to everybody so they can review, but what's the best way for some of us to advocate for additional counselors? Right, so obviously we can um, get in touch with our, our representatives, right? We can um, contact the, the Tennessee chapter of, um, similar to ASCA, right, ASCA, to uh, help with that. But I would say our representatives, our senators, legislatures, um, to advocate for the ratio specifically. But I mean, I'm just gonna put a plug in here too, to um, advocate also that it's fair. Because um, when you look at this, you guys, and, and like I said, I don't want to get on my soapbox, but we have one of the, the most diverse districts in the whole state. And I think our um, on the new formula, our students will only be spending like 4,200 um, per student where um, giving to smaller districts, right, is going to be putting them up to eight or $9,000 a student. So the funding formula really isn't looking at our most needy kids. I mean, because we have some of the most uh, economically disadvantaged. We definitely have the most EL students in the whole state. And so it is um, far from equitable. I'll just say that. So uh, as you're advocating for um, the counselor ratios, uh, I would also ask, please advocate that they relook at how it's allocated, the funding's allocated, so they're truly being equitable based on need. Thank so, you. That yeah, and I'm sorry, one thing I will just say as I talk about that, like the lowest, if, if this kind of puts you in any type of, a, can give you a comparison. So Sevier County will only um, get 4,000 in about $50 dollars per student and then Memphis will actually I was a little off we'll get about 8500 and we're just at four thousand eighty dollars a student and so um definitely some concern um because like I said it's about two million dollars two million two hundred million dollars less than uh what we're current our current operating budget's at Wow, I didn't realize that. So that would greatly impact the budget on, would that cause us potentially to lose some counselors in the national area? Well, I think in the base funding, they require that you have those, if, if they actually write that in, right? Um, the 250 to one ratio, then you have to have it because they're providing the funding, right? So in that sense, I think definitely counselors will be safe. Um, but it's what else we'll have to, um, you know what I mean? The, the, when you don't have that much money, $200 million, obviously there's going to be deficits somewhere. And unfortunately, you know, when we're trying to improve scores and achievement in a big urban school district, a $200 million deficit is not the way to do it. Yeah, we'd love to open it up for other questions at this time. If anyone has questions for Megan or David. Um, about this funding. And like we said, we'll make sure to send this out to everyone too, the whole report. Can, can I ask a quick question, Kelly? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Whoever will forgive me. I, I'm like the new person from California. And David, if you don't know, people in Middle Tennessee really love when Californians move here. It's great. Um, I, I just noticed, as and I might be misunderstanding some of the articles here, but like a lot of the funding in there seems to be very friendly to, to charter schools. Um, like even saw the formula is like the base times 4%. So it seems like charters just automatically get 4% more than districts. Um, I think I could go on a whole rant about that, but most specifically to counselors, I'm assuming like the charters will still be um, like the exempt from the 250 to one ratio, but like, and then 
not all, but some charter schools don't include counselors, either social, emotional or college. Like, I don't know, this is really a question. I'm just like, how do we advocate for that knowing that certainly there's a lot of charter school elements there, which aren't inherently bad, but just a big variety. So, I mean, I can add a little bit to that. We, within our district right now, we have eight, eight, nine, nine um, high school charters, right? So, you know, the way they work in Tennessee, obviously, is that um, we have local, we're technically their local umbrella, right? But we don't have a whole lot of local control. You have to follow the federal, the state, um, laws, right? But as far as implementation of other things, that kind of is left to the charter. And so um, all charters do not have school counselors. There's a lot of names for different people in charters, right? Sometimes you'll have true mental health professionals. Sometimes you may have a school counselor, may have a college and career counselor, but usually not. You usually have people who are kind of doing several jobs. But um, some of the, the charters do have both. So it kind of just depends and varies on the charter. And if it's not written into their initial, obviously, contract um, and uh, application of uh, before it was approved by the district, the state, then, um, I should then uh, you know, they don't have to necessarily follow these new requirements. So as far as advocating, and, and that would be a whole separate, uh, a separate um, soapbox for, for school vouchers, because really, really, um, if you know Tennessee over the last couple of years, they've really been trying to focus on school vouchers for private schools. And so um, I think some of this is going to charters, and then they're trying to adjust it to, to, to allow for those school vouchers for private schools. So advocacy is just, you know, helping the public schools, obviously, because these are public funds and um, ensuring that, uh, you know, if they are going to give these additional funds to these charter schools, then that they need to also have these positions that they're doing the base funding for, right? That's what my probably um, recommendation would be. If we're using state funds for charter schools that technically live under the state LEAs, then um, they need to follow the same requirements because they are getting base funding and it's supposed to cover school counselors. And I think just to add on to that from what Megan said, watching the press conference when they released this, um, the statement from our governor was that public schools are charter schools and charter schools are public schools. So maybe not to get on my soapbox either, but just to give that perspective as well. So and that's I'll a just, direct quote. <laughs> that's not being biased. That's a direct quote from the from the press conference. <laughs> and I'll just add to Kelly and charter schools are public schools that have to live under public schools because that's state law. Does anybody else have any questions that we can add? I appreciate Carolyn adding the comment in the chat. David, do you have any comments to add from hearing Megan's perspective on the funding? I'll simply note that this is this is exactly why at NACAC, why we can monitor legislation. So I see these things popping up. I, I we cannot, you know, monitor, we cannot, we can monitor, we cannot act without consulting you all first, because this is a, and, and we never do, we, we always, I think it's instructive as we think about how NACAC relates to SACAC and our other affiliates, and even the state components of SACAC, where if, if, if either we see something that, that looks good or bad, our first stop would be you. Likewise, <clears throat> if you all needed help with something, and said, geez, I wonder if NACAC could help us get an action alert up or send a letter or do something like that. You could come to us and we would, we would then, and then everything follows from that. So it's just a good example of where we might see something that looks intriguing. The, the real story is, is at the state level. So, and, and for any of you that, that wanna get involved in this, you know, this, is, this is why, as Leslie said up top, we are definitely an open door. We love to take questions and help get involved and, and do whatever we can to support what it what you're doing because you're the you're the true leaders here. 
Thank you, David. I think I'll kick it over to Anne Catherine. Well, thank you, Megan and David. We really appreciate that and, and all the questions that were asked. Um, now we have our SACAC Government Relations Representative, Jade Dominique, and she is the Associate Director of Admissions at Agnes Scott, and she just is going to make a few announcements for us. So Jade. Thank you. Hi, y'all. Um, again, my name is Jade Domain. I uh, work for Agnes Scott College, but I have had so much fun today getting to learn more about Tennessee and advocacy efforts in Tennessee and things like that. Um, I want to reiterate what David said earlier. Thank you so much for being here. I know that it takes time away from our, our day jobs to do advocacy work and to learn about these things. And I know it means that you're here because you, you really care about kind of making a difference for our students and our profession. Um, I just wanted to give a couple of updates. Um, I wanted to uh, remind everyone here that SACAC launched um, free membership for public school counselors and CBO community-based organi organization professionals um, for this upcoming year. And we're so excited about that. Um, so if you can, if you are a public school counselor and you're not already a SACAC member, uh, we would love to have you uh, have your membership. Um, and for those of you who work at private institutions um, or work on the college side, if you can help us spread the word, um, we'd really appreciate it. This is really, we um, value the, the insights and the voices of our public school counselors who of course are doing a lot of this this direct work and um, specifically I can speak from a government relations standpoint like a big part of what we're advocating for is um, you know increased access for for or sorry uh, smaller student to counselor ratios so um, it's a really really important perspective and um, uh, for us to have um, I hope to see many of you at the um, SACAC conference in Orlando. Um, I did want to mention that there's going to be a session on advocacy. It's called To the Capital and Beyond. Um, and so we're going to talk about ways that um, if, if, as my colleague, y'all might know, Ashley Young, who's also on the board, likes to say, um, what burns your biscuits? Uh, if your biscuits are burning from this conversation, we're going to be talking about small, medium, and big steps that you can take towards advocacy, um, meeting with legislators, um, emailing legislators, different ways that um, individual states have kind of gone beyond their advocacy days even um, to really kind of advocate and make a change. So hope to see um, many of you here, uh, many of you there. And uh, finally, I just wanted to say thank you so, so much. I already said thank you to all of our participants, but thank you to Leslie and Kelly and Anne Catherine for putting on this program. Um, again, I know it takes a lot of work outside. This is no one's full-time job, right? So uh, I really appreciate y'all inviting really great speakers and, um, and kind of putting this program together. Um, and I want to give an official congratulations to Kelly, who's joining SACAC Ford um, this upcoming year. So, so excited to, I know I emailed you, but so excited to get to work with you more in that capacity. Um, so thanks you all so much for, for letting me take up some of your time, even though I'm in Georgia, um, but I'm so glad that because this is virtual, I was able to actually attend. Um, and if anyone is interested in getting involved in um, SACAC or, you know, whether it's government relations work or anything else, um, and you're not able to attend the conference, I would love if you, I'll put my email address in the chat, uh, feel free to reach out to me and I can connect you with opportunities. We're always looking for volunteers. Um, I'm happy to talk more about ways that um, you can kind of move this forward and advocate. So thank you again, everyone. Thank you so much, Jade. Um, thank you everyone for being here today. And Catherine, Leslie, did y'all have anything to add? I think and Catherine put her thumbs up. <laughs> um, um, but we do so appreciate Megan and David being here today. We're gonna email out um, the report that Megan mentioned, the slides from today. Um, I'll also send out information on the free membership and Jade's um, information. So be looking for that um, information in your email to come. Um, and if you all have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us, okay? I hope everyone has a great rest of their week.